Okay, class, we're going to talk very briefly uh, about cardiovascular considerations in the athlete. So as we discussed, you know, the, the, every patient has a heart and, you know, at least one lung. And, you know, there are cardiac issues that, you know, we need to be aware of across populations and sports is no different. So uh, just bear in mind that, you know, there are some terms you may see seen thrown out there at the athlete's heart. So um, as we know, with uh, chronic exercise training, especially aerobic training, um, there is going to be remodeling to the heart, right? So the heart becomes more efficient. Um, it, you know, it's able to eject more blood uh, per beat. And so we often see these much lower uh, heart rates. Um, but again, like this is still technically an abnormality. It's benign. It's physiological. It's related to improved performance. Um, you know, but just to give you just some bearing, you know, bear in mind. So Oscar Fence, uh, Svensson. As uh, an 18-year-old from Lillehammer, Norway, uh, he, I believe at the time, um, had the highest VO2 ever recorded, right, at 97.5 uh, uh, mils per kg per minute. So, um, again, way above normal averages. And when you look at his uh, resting heart rate, somewhere in the 30s, right? So just giving an appreciation for uh, the changes that we see in an athlete. Um, that there will be normal adaptations to to the heart, to the cardiovascular system, um, that you know are physiological, are are you know benign, and actually lead to improved performance. So we're going to talk about um, in this lecture normal adaptations in the athlete's heart. We'll get into some pathology, physical therapy implications, and then a brief discussion on screening. So like I mentioned. Normal findings in an athlete, again, um, is this left ventricular hypertrophy, but it, it's reversible, right? So you guys remembering back, the, you know, from we, our discussion on cardiomyopathies, those aren't reversible changes. Those are fixed changes due to a disease process, either a congenital issue or something related to lifestyle factors like hypertensive uh, heart disease. So they have a left ventricular hypertrophy, but the most important thing to note, the left ventricular wall thickness and cavity size both increase, and they increase proportionally. So it permits enhanced filling and improved pumping performance, so they can maintain uh, a pretty high cardiac output at a, you know, at a high heart rate. So again, it, it, this, this is something in an adaptation that we see in athletes, and in fact, the reversible nature of a of the heart is actually what we leverage in screening tools. So if we the, suspect the patient has left ventricular hypertrophy, we're a little concerned, what we'll often do is put them on a period of about three months of deconditioning to see if the heart's shape and size, you know, goes back to normal. Is it reversible? If it's not, then there, there may be other decisions that have to be made. You might see bradycardia, again, again, going back to that cardiac output equation, right? So cardiac output, of course, equals, you know, Q, Q equals heart rate, right, times stroke volume, right? So in this example, right, stroke volume is really increased. So to maintain a normal cardiac output, you know, uh, we don't really need heart rate to be that high. So this actually goes down. Um, you'll see an increased VO2 max or VO2 peak. Again, that example of Oscar Svensson, we'll see people... You know, in you know, his is a rare example in the 90s, but typically you'll see VO2 somewhere above 50 um, in a well-trained uh, male athlete, somewhere I think 45, 40 to 45 in, in a female athlete, typically. Um, sinus arrhythmia, we talked about that, that R to R wave variability, which reflects a high um, vagus outflow at rest, which you often see in people who chronically exercise as well with, with adequate recovery. Uh, a transient splitting of the S2 heart sound. We think, again, that's related to you know, thoracic pressure changes related to some of the variability we see. But basically, if we hear a discordance of the second heart sound that widens with inspiration and gets attenuated or diminishes with expiration or things that raise uh, thoracic pressure, you know, that's, that's a transient presentation in nature of that splitting sound. That's normal. That's not, you know, again, an abnormality, um, an abnormality, but a benign um, uh, benign change. So normal in an athlete, fairly, you know, you know, um, you know, but and benign, right? So these are abnormalities relative to the population. It's fairly normal to occur in an athlete, just to, to bear that in mind. So um, one thing I want to touch on are just some exercise related complications. So syncope is actually a pretty common, um, you know, a, a 
you know, occurrence in, in athletic events. If anyone's participated as an athletic you know, trainer or even just an athlete themselves, especially in sports like uh, endurance sports, like marathons or cross country, um, you may see people pass out, right? Especially if they're working to get their PR or really, really exerting themselves. Um, so post-exercise syncope, not uncommon, not super concerning for a cardiac related issue. Could be due to a lot of other factors, just exhaustion, could be um, hyponatremia, could be maybe um, a rapid you know, reduction in preload. So if you're exercising, again, TPR reduces um, and your heart rate's up really high. If you suddenly stop exercising after working at a high intensity, um, you lose a muscle pump, you lose venous return um, with a high, with a heart rate still sort of elevated, you may run the risk of potentially uh, you know, having a significant drop in cardiac output. If it drops enough to go to the brain, you're going to pass out. So, so I've always recommended to cool down, gradually bring yourself back down while still using that muscle pump with an active cool down, letting the heart rate come down gradually as well, especially in an older individual. Um, but again, anything after exercise could be related to a number of factors, not necessarily a cardiac cause. If it happens during exercise, though, much more concerning, typically linked to something arrhythmogenic, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy um, or other conditions. Right. So anytime someone passes out, we always want to make sure we, we interrogate when it happened, did it happen in recovery? Did it happen while you were running? And then we wanna ask bystanders as well. We wanna have these conversations in private, um, not in front of maybe a coach, maybe not in front of like other people, because um, athletes notoriously hide symptoms, hide conditions. So if you're working in high level athletes um, or in any level of athletes, like you, you, it's gotta be mindful of those things. So, um, and then if someone passes out or has a syncopal episode, they might not remember, right? So just, you know, of what happened to them. So always kind of, you know, get a, get a you, know, you know, ask the right questions, do them in a private space, um, and then, you know, interrogate for what you think is going on, screen for other, other defects, Marfan's or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy being pretty big ones. Um, and then just dehydration. So uh, I got a picture here, Loud and Slain from the cold classic um, Vision Quest, probably my, one of my favorite movies as a former high school wrestler myself. Um, but it's a big problem, in, especially in sports where people, where there's weight limits, right? So people um, would, you know, historically work out in these rubber suits and get, you know, the, the sweat off water weight, dehydrate themselves. Uh, that's why these things are, for the most part, banned and actually why there's been a bigger push in sports like wrestling for people to wrestle closer to their kind of walking around weight. So they don't go through these huge swings in, in uh, body weight and in hydration status because, um, as you dehydrate, like performance does suffer, you get fatigued a lot earlier. It can also um, trigger arrhythmias, right? So, um, you know, again, heart rate, you know, goes up typically in, in excessive heat. Um, and as you continue to sweat, you lose blood volume, right? And we'll show an example of kind of what happens in someone who doesn't uh, replace fluids while while working out just in general. So if you're wearing a sweat suit, it's going to make it even even worse. So um, just be be mindful of that you know, especially if you're working in hot and humid environments, um, to you know follow a, a, a body hydration or rehydration uh, strategy. The National Athletic Training Association has a great one here. There's a link for that in the in the slides. And again, like body temperature, like, you know, as you, as you continue to exercise, as heat goes up, um, especially if you're working in a hot, you know, ambient air, right, you can, you can see, you know, a 10 beat per minute increase, typically per, per degree centigrade. So every one, one centigrade increase we see in body temperature, we see typically see heart rate go up, um, independent, right, of, um, of other factors. So just be aware of, of working out in temperature and, and always make sure your, you know, your athletes aren't doing something like this because it's very, very dangerous. Um, and again, uh, this is an example of what we see here with, without fluid replacement. So again, as we continue to exercise, right? Like we, we start losing blood volume, right? Because we are sweating. Like we're, we're, that's where, you know, that, that same plasma volume, right? That you know, contributes to our, the, the suspension uh, of blood, right? Suspension being a fluid mixed with a, a bunch of other um, products, we lose volume to sweating, right? We start seeing stroke volume start to suffer. And concomitantly, heart rate has to increase to make up, uh, you know, the, the slack. 
problem is, though, if you, you know, we start you know, escalating heart rate, it's going to increase the work that the heart has to, has to you know, perform to exercise, um, and thus potentially increasing the risk for some sort of arrhythmia. So um, unfortunately, you know, for, many, for many years, you know, again, wrestlers or, or gymnasts or boxers would wear these rubber suits, um, and the more common, can, common arrhythmia that would develop in these athletes would be uh, supraventricular tachycardia. Um, the problem with that is, like, you know, um, while that's still producing a, you know, heart rate, still producing a pressure wave downstream, um, you know, that can quickly deteriorate into a situation where that patient, that, that athlete goes into VFib. The unfortunate thing with SVT is because they're working at such a, at a high clip of a heart rate, they burn through their glycogen stores. So if they have to get resuscitated or defibrillated, that glycogen that's needed to kind of restart the heart to get it back into a normal sinus rhythm might not be there. And they are really hard to resuscitate and has a very high fatality. So that's why we don't see those rubber suits anymore because it's just very dangerous. Um, another thing that's also just kind of fascinating about exercise is we do see some acute remodeling um, to the right ventricle especially. We think this has to do with, with just the increased amount of preload, the stretch that's imposed on the right ventricle. Uh, the key thing to bear in mind is th though we see some biomarkers that are elevated, we think it's made us due to increased strain. Realistically, these are all reversed within a day or two. And the, the evidence does not support that, like participating in, you know, chronic aerobic exercise is like, you know, a, a risk greater than the benefits of aerobic exercise. But just be mindful of that, especially if you have someone who is, you know, participating in multiple, multiple, multiple marathons back to back. I mean, it's, I think that's a, it's a, an increased kind of trend you see on social media. There's people doing these multiple marathons, you know, a marathon each day. Just be mindful of that. Like your body does need time to recover, um, including your heart. Um, interesting enough, we're also finding that like it, it may be linked potentially, chronic aerobic exercise uh, may be linked to a higher prevalence of atrial fibrillation. We may we think it may have to do with just chronic change of potentially the right ventricle. It's still kind of inconclusive because you know, the, the, the nature of, of atrial fibrillation is kind of idiopathic um, and related to nodal fibrosis and, and um, breakdown. Whether or not that's necessarily due to um, aerobic exercise or other factors still kind of remains to be seen. And again, just like with the acute effects, there really is no evidence to support that endurance exercise or this risk of you know, AFib in the future um, is you know sufficient enough to outweigh the benefits of chronic participation in aerobic exercise. So just be mindful of these things that you know that there, there's these population um, specific increases. So be aware of screening for AFib maybe in an older athlete, and then just be mindful of recovery in someone who has just participated in a marathon or, or endurance event. And then here's an example of just what we're talking about that we see these changes. Um, in right ventricular function, so right ventricular ejection fraction, um, you know, sees, sees a significant dip post race, um, but then you know, within you know a few hours, really after, it's right back to where it had been at normal. And there's of course some variance. Some people don't really don't really change that much. So just be mindful of this that like there, you know, it's important that people take time for recovery after exercise, especially for you know long term endurance events. So. Uh, that's all we have for this unit, and then the next we'll get into some common conditions you might encounter.